Welcome back to Doctor in Forensics. Every now and again, you have to put out information that is very uncomfortable and seems to be just matter of fact. Today's title of the video says it all. Woe to those taken from Isaiah 520. If you're familiar with the channel, you know we don't ever like to just take one scripture and, and teach from or preach a gospel from it. But this particular scripture just does stand alone by yourself. You know, I have a question for you. The country is opening up and you real soon will be allowed to go back to your church. So here's the question. When you go back to your church, what exactly are you going back to? When you go back to your church, what exactly are you going back to? The scripture in Isaiah 520 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And it seems over the last year, we have seen quite a bit of this. So it's time to examine our churches and our hearts. We're gonna get into woe to those in just a second. The church has changed. We have the pre-COVID church and now we have almost the post-COVID church. But what has happened in between is next to heretical altogether. Churches, organizations, denominations that we thought were solid have completely showed their colors and have obfuscated from the truth of the gospel that they purported to teach. There are churches now that have succumbed to the woke gospel. There are churches now that have succumbed to the LGBTQ community. There are churches that have now gone sympathetic to the truth of the gospel about the transgender agenda, homosexuality, and abortion. It makes you wonder, were they ever really clearly committed to the cause of Christ in the beginning? Now, one doesn't have to look very far to get a clear picture of exactly what's going on. And of course, our friends over at Reformation Charlotte, they have thick skin and ice for blood that they're able to endure all of the shenanigans that goes on in the name of Christ and expose all of the foolishness that most of us will never hear about. Watch this.
The word woe does not have the impact that it should from a biblical perspective. We've all read it in the Bible, but it has not really resonated just how profound this word is. The word woe is often used to express grief, regret, misfortune, or grievous distress stated from such a great affliction of some sort or being in trouble that is hard to get out of or escape from. Sometimes a woe is almost impossible to describe and words fail us so woe may be the only thing we can say to express our feelings very much like when we groan. Now the biblical definition is even more woeful than I'm actually describing right now. The word woe for believers has lost its impact. Somehow it has, has become diluted. So hopefully this study will help you to understand the significance of the word woe as used in the Bible. The word woe in the Greek is pronounced way. It's spelled O-U-A-I, O-U-A-I, and it's pronounced way. And it's more than just an expression of a feeling. Woe is judgment as we read in the book of Revelation chapters 8, 9, 11, and 12. It means alas, or almost like, oh no. When the word woe is used, it is quite possibly signifying impending doom, condemnation, and or the wrath of God. So it is never used to only emphasize something in the sentence in which it is used. Context is always king when this word is used. The Hebrew word for the word woe is hoi and essentially means the very same thing as it does when used in the New Testament. Jesus used the word woe more than anyone else in the Bible. The Gospel of Luke has twice as many woes, 13, than the nearest book in the Old Testament, which is Ezekiel, which has six, and only Matthew has nearly as many. He has 12 in his Gospel. When God's judgment upon sinful mankind is revealed, the Apostle John writes, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow, as read in Revelation 8.13. So he is showing the greatest significant possible by repeating it three times. The use of the words three times in the Bible is so rare that it is only done when the holiness of God is described in Revelation 4.8 and in Isaiah 6.3. Jesus used the word woe seven times in Matthew chapter 23, indicating completeness of the woes or judgments of God as seven is the number of completion or perfection indicating God's judgment will be complete and perfectly just. The words of Jesus have never been more sombering and applicable. Matthew 23, 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. I don't know, sometimes I feel like it should be said that many of the ministries and fake, phony, and false pastors and teachers and preachers should be on what's called the ELPT, the Eternal Life Prevention Team. It seems that everything that they do, teach, and preach is preventing those who are looking for God from truly finding Him. In the Old Testament, Hosea gives us a good idea of the use of the word woe in writing about Israel, he says, Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. Hosea 7.13 And the Philistines living in Cana, Woe to you, inhabitants of the sea coast, you nations of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Cana land of the Philistines, and I will destroy you until no inhabitants is left. Zephaniah 2.5 There are also woes to them who cause others to stumble, or cause those to sin, as Habakkuk writes, Woe to him who makes his neighbor drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. 
Habakkuk 2.15. Now, have you ever had someone tempt you to sin? If you are a believer, that person who is trying to get you to sin has the judgment or woe of God on them. As Jesus said in Matthew 18.7, Jesus said, woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. There is also a woe given to those who acquire riches by evil means as Habakkuk writes. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high to be safe from the reach of harm. Habakkuk 2.9 That sounds like our politicians in Washington, D.C. The greatest concentration of woes in the Bible is found in Matthew 23. Here Jesus uses them against the rebellious leaders who believed in their own righteousness, which is really no righteousness at all, but self-righteousness, which was a stench in the nose of God. Jesus first addresses the scribes and the Pharisees by saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Matthew 23, 13. Now, because they were creating an impossible standard for entering the kingdom, no one could seem to enter. When they made converts, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Quite an indictment. Matthew 23, 15. What Jesus was saying here is that the scribes and Pharisees would do anything to make a convert of Judaism. But then they required of them such a standard of self-righteousness that no one could possibly achieve salvation. They tithed the smallest of things that they weren't ever required, but neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting of others. Matthew 23, 23. They looked holy on the outside, Jesus said, but Jesus knew their heart and that inside they were full of greed and self-indulgence and outwardly, they appear beautiful, but within they are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. In conclusion, saints, we must have the righteousness of God to enter the kingdom. No amount of self-righteousness will ever be enough because God sees our works as nothing more than filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6, and he will not accept them. That presents a problem since only righteous people can enter the kingdom as it is written. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. Revelation 21, 27. Here's how the problem can be solved. We must repent and trust Christ because it was for our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we in him might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 I like to thank Pastor Jack Wellman of the Milvane Brethren Church in Milvane, Kansas for his article writing and ChristianCrier.com. I will leave a link to his article below. This certainly was beneficial for me. I hope it was beneficial for you. And as always, I want to thank you for listening to Doctrine Forensics. And if you like this material, please click, like, subscribe, comment, and share. God bless you and your family.